long run that had that weird virus. He, you. You think those were actors? No. No. Steve Johnson. <laughs> When I was a kid, I uh, was just always interested in this stuff. I had a real inherent interest in, in, in monsters, and I, I really couldn't pinpoint why I did. I was growing up at a time when this was not a popular thing. Steve Johnson learned the art of makeup effects by gluing dried apples and hairy wigs to a friend's face. Johnson was on a serious quest to unlock the mysteries of monster makeup. Eventually, Steve approached top Hollywood makeup effects artist Rick Baker at a convention near his home in Houston. I think the thing that impressed him actually was not that my work was good because it wasn't. I mean, I was a 14-year-old kid playing with apple cores, but what he was impressed with was that at that time, as far as I was from the center of, of the film industry, I was trying to figure these techniques out on my own, and I had enough energy to, to really pursue it. Two weeks after Johnson arrived in Los Angeles, at the tender age of 18, Baker gave him a job, and he hasn't stopped working since. <laughs> After learning the tricks of the makeup trade as a team player on films like American Werewolf in London and The Howling, Johnson formed his own company, XFX. Always on time, that's what I like. Now that he's the boss, Johnson can spend more time conceptualizing projects and less time getting his hands dirty. Not that he ever minded that aspect of the job, he was just a little too sensitive to handle the criticism that came with it. I used to have a real problem because I wanted to be an artist. Like, damn it, I'm an artist. I'm going to make my stand and I'm going to do what I think's right for this picture. I don't care who else doesn't like it. Producers come in, they hate it, change the nose, make the nose longer, make the chin short. The director comes in, oh, the chin's too short, make it longer, make the nose longer. And it would just drive me crazy. I would just boil because I would just know I was right. <laughs> Fortunately, Johnson has made his peace with directors and realizes his relationship with them is one of mutual respect. Yeah, right. And the director always has the final say about everything. That probably weighs close to you, right? Yeah. For instance, when Jim Cameron asked Johnson to create the most beautiful ethereal image ever put on film for The Abyss, no problema. Johnson delivered. If this was the only job I've ever had in my life that I have thought, you know, I've halfway through the job I thought, I'm not going to make it through this. It literally was that hard because everything we tried, if we tried, if we found a material that would work underwater that was glass clear, then we couldn't make it glow or illuminate itself. If we found one that would glow and illuminate, then it wouldn't work underwater. Johnson had an easier time creating the aliens for Roswell the recent Showtime movie about a mysterious incident in the New Mexico desert. Everybody's seen a hundred times this typical communion, big-headed, big almond-shaped eyed alien done. I've never seen it done well, so I thought, great, here's an opportunity to do it right. And so I did, I approached every aspect about the building of this alien in a different way than I normally would have. Johnson is currently working on Clive Barker's Lord of Illusions and Stephen King's The Langoliers projects in which he may very well have to utilize computer-generated effects. For a while, Johnson was a bit freaked out about the computer craze. He refused to see Jurassic Park for months. But the benefits of combining traditional and cutting-edge techniques are now crystal clear. If I read a script and it says 10,000 slugs crawl across the ceiling and transform into butterflies, I don't want to have to come up with a way to do that physically. I mean, that's a perfect opportunity for, for computer-generated animation.